Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join this conversation. Really thrilled to be starting off a series of conversations um, hosted by Chicago African Americans in philanthropy with you all today. Um, I want to provide just a brief overview of our organization and the work that we're doing, as well as some introductions of our speakers before we get started. But as people continue to join, I hope that you will join in your lines, um, but certainly keep the chat active. We'll be collecting questions for our speakers throughout the conversation today. So feel free to start posting into the chat as you start to have questions. If there's any technical difficulties that you're experiencing, by all means, please reach out to me in a private message and I will do what I can to take care of those. So thank you again for joining this conversation. I'm Jessica Dudley, the Director of Chicago African Americans and Philanthropy. For those of you who may not be familiar with our work, the organization is a membership organization committed to promoting dialogue, advancing advocacy, and investing in African American communities. We work to build infrastructure that really leads to equitable leadership roles in the social sector. Um, throughout this month, as I mentioned, we'll be hosting conversations on the impact of COVID-19 and learning about efforts to support communities of color. I hope that you'll visit our website if you haven't already to learn more about these events and subscribe to our newsletter so that you're aware of opportunities to join upcoming calls. Um, turning to this afternoon's conversation, I'm really, really excited to have Elizabeth Todd Breedlin, Francie Richards, and Joanna Johan now Wheaton joining us for this conversation about the impact of COVID-19 on access to education and our CPS students. I'll briefly introduce each of our speakers, ask them to respond to a couple of broad questions, and then open it up to your questions. Certainly want to have the opportunity for you to all join this conversation and have your questions answered. Um, I'll ask that you remain on mute uh, while our guests are speaking and please use the chat to share your thoughts and questions. I'll monitor the chat and um, I'll be sure to ask our questions um, that come on through the chat of our speakers. So briefly, Elizabeth Todd Breedlin is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois at Chicago and a member of the Chicago Board of Education. She focuses her research on Af African American history and the history of education. Her work explores interdisciplinary issues related to racial and economic inequality, urban public policy, neighborhood transformation, education policy, and civic engagement. I know that many folks on the line have read her book, A Political Education, Black Politics and Education Reform in Chicago since the 1960s, which analyzes the transformation in Black politics, shifts in modes of education organizing, and the racial politics of education reform for the 1960s to the present. Francie Richards is the executive director of the Children's First Fund. Francie brokers partnerships and secures and organizes funds for initiatives that advance CPS's vision. Um, she was previ previously the founding Central U.S. Regional Director of WE Charity, an international organization that empowers 4 million youth to change the world through service. She led programming and development across the Midwest and launched WE's U.S. expansion alongside youth, educators, parents, business leaders, philanthropies, and celebrities. And Johanna is the director of Major Gifts, responsible for designing, implementing, and managing the alumni giving and major support programs for Children First Fund. Um, she graduated magna cum laude from Kenyon College with a bachelor's in arts and English and following graduation moved to Chicago to begin her fundraising career at Lurie Children's Hospital. Um, so, so excited to have you all on the call. I'm just going to do one more check to make sure that I have everyone who is waiting admitted. We have a great number of people on the call. Really glad to have you all here and to get us started. Elizabeth, I'd love if you could just get us up to date on where we are with students, particularly those in CPS and sort of the policies that are taking place, how they're getting access to education and what it means for them to be learning from home. Um, well, let me just start by thanking you, Jessica, and thanking all of Chicago African Americans and philanthropy for having us here today. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share some of the challenges, but also opportunities um, that exist within Chicago public schools in particular, um, but education more generally at this time. Um, and I, it's, although I can't see all of you, it's good to be around some folks who I've spent some time with before. Um, I was very 
uh, it was very, a wonderful experience for me last year to have the opportunity um, to speak on a panel with CAPE. So thank you um, for having us. I, I guess I want to start by saying something that I think we all know, but just to say it out loud, our communities were in crisis before COVID-19. Um, our communities experienced a number of major challenges, economic challenges, challenges in healthcare, challenges in healthcare access. Um, inequity is, is a state of being and has been uh, for many years here in the city of Chicago and certainly nationally as well. So I think one of the things I wanna talk about um, is sort of some level setting around what's different about the nature of the crises that our students and families are facing right now. So, I think that COVID-19 has um, exacerbated existing inequities uh, for our families, and that can look like different things. It can look like losing a job. It can look like uh, being a frontline, these are for parents, uh, being a frontline worker in grocery stores, being a frontline worker in the healthcare industry, um, being in warehouses working right now. It can look like, um, not being able to see family members who used to provide really important um, extended care for families, for children. It can look like young people now having to take care of siblings while their parents work as frontline workers, but they are now home from school because they don't have a school to go to. Uh, so I just sort of want to give a sense of the broad sweep of, of the experiences that folks are having. Um, food insecurity that existed before has been exacerbated in this environment. Um, and I think the other thing to stress is that in our current state, the public sector over the last 30, myself as a historian, right, over the last 30 to 50 years has really taken a beating and been stripped down. And so when we think about the existing social safety nets for our families and for the most vulnerable young people in particular in our city, all of this comes to bear at the front of the schoolhouse door. And schools and public schools continue to serve as that last line um, of defense in some ways as providing those crucial support services that otherwise would not be there. And what I mean by that are things like food. Chicago public schools, since the um, schools were closed, since March 17th has served over 8 million meals um, to young people and their families in the city. And I think sometimes we, when we talk about education, we jump to talk about remote learning and I'm gonna get to that, I promise. Um, but I think one of the things we need to realize is that public schools in this city do much more than simply provide instruction. They feed young people and their families uh, year round always and particularly right now. They also uh, serve to Sometimes schools are washing children's clothing, washing families' clothing uh, in some buildings. So all of the different services that are provided in school buildings that are now closed. And I think that's sort of what we're facing in the education environment um, is thinking about what that looks like now that that important service that used to be there is no longer there. And as I said, I think one of the things as a board of education member that I've been most proud of is particularly the efforts in um, food service. So as I mentioned, Chicago Public Schools has served over 8 million students and uh, 8 million, I'm sorry, 8 million uh, meals since March 17th. And um, I, just as, by way of food, I'll give an example of how crucial philanthropy has been to that. So as a public institution, as you know, a public institution that's getting some federal money for a food program, uh, we had some capacity to provide food. However, in those early days, philanthropic support was crucial to setting tents up in front of schools, to getting all the support around food distribution. Now, as food distribution is more up and running, philanthropic support has been crucial to making sure that deliveries of food can be made to homes for those who would not otherwise um, be able to access one of the buildings where we continue to provide food. Um, so I guess, again, the first line of defense for public schools and, and what families are facing is just having their basic needs met, food. Another major point of philanthropic support that has been so crucial right now is emergency funds. As I've mentioned, families are losing jobs, families who are already in financially precarious situations. And in Chicago public schools, over 75% of our students and families um, qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, those families now have even greater needs than they had before. And so uh, the Children First Fund, which I'll have an opportunity to pass over to my colleagues in a moment, have had the opportunity to give direct financial economic relief to families. And then certainly also there have been challenges around remote learning. The digital divide, like other inequities, 
uh, are not is not something new. It uh, is along socioeconomic, but also racial lines in the city. And when we look at the communities that are both being most impacted by uh, COVID-19 deaths, um, who are often on the front lines of that work, and then also having a lack of access to internet um, in order for students to even do the remote learning that they have in front of them, those are our communities of color, our low-income communities, and particularly our Black communities in the city, which again is, I think, why it's so important um, to be talking to you all as an audience today. Um, certainly, I'm happy to talk about all of the conditions facing um, CPS students broadly, but particularly the conditions being faced in uh, by African-American communities right now. So I think I'm going to toss it to Francie and Joanna to talk a bit more about the um, Children's First Fund and the way that the Children First Fund has been able to address some of these issues. Thank you, Board Member Breland, and and thank you, Jessica, and everyone for having us here today. I'm inspired by the way that we've been able to mobilize so that our students could be served quickly, and and that's in large part due to roles that you all have played and your organizations have played. So thank you for having us and, and giving us the opportunity to say thank you. Um, I, I'm Francie. I lead the Children First Fund, and for those who maybe um, haven't engaged with the Children First Fund yet or not in a long time. Um, quick overview here is when Dr. Jackson became CEO of CPS, one of the first things she wanted to do was give back to the community of supporters that has stood by CPS for so many years, uh, that being the foundations and corporate partners and um, generous families that have been at the district side and have provided um, enriching supports for our students for, for years when the district frankly couldn't and, and could hardly afford to um, have a, a public affairs unit within the system, making it really hard to navigate CPS and, and to try to help our students, which we know our community loves to do. So the Children First Fund was relaunched um, as less of an internal facing fiscal agent that he, it had been for the last 20 years to a public facing proactive fundraising arm. Um, and so today uh, we've been able to exercise our new muscles as a proactive fundraiser in light of COVID-19 whereby when uh, dollars were available or partnerships and resources were available, we've been able to work in close uh, communication with our CPS colleagues and learn more about the digital divide, get information about what the, uh, you know, how dollars might stand up a meal distribution effort quickly. Uh, and we've been able to serve as that liaison between the philanthropic community and the system to identify where uh, philanthropic support could have an impact and where um, public dollars would need to be leveraged uh, in order to, to solve problems that we can solve for students and families right now. So I'll, I'll actually stop there and um, we'll be able to answer specific questions about how you've been able to be helpful with COVID from here. Wonderful. Thank you both for sharing those introductory remarks. Um, I think it would be great for this group to just get an understanding. I think many in this group are aware that there were already significant challenges to accessing education and certainly to um, equitable access to education, but certainly this moment has laid bare that challenge and made it even more difficult. If you could describe some of the challenges that our CPS students are facing and sort of what we know about how they are addressing, meeting those challenges to make sure that they're able to continue their education at this point. I think that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so certainly um, on uh, at the end of March and now that we've moved into April um, and oh, it's May, Lord, <laughs> we have officially started remote learning. Um, the first few weeks that students were away from school was sort of a period of transition. They were considered by the state as act of God days, but now we have officially launched our um, CPS remote learning plan. We're in the third week or have completed three weeks of that plan now. And so what that means is that ideally, um, we would like for every student to have access to both a device and internet access in order to engage with their uh, teachers. Some of that will be synchronous lessons, some of them are asynchronous lessons. I think the, the main sort of thrust and the first order of affairs is contact, contact and engagement. We, need, we want to be able to reach out to our families. We want to find out what their needs are, um, also what their students' needs are, and then also try to continue to provide learning opportunities uh, for students. 
we recognize, again, that a digital divide existed before COVID. It has been highlighted for those maybe who didn't know about it before now. And a significant portion of our students do not have access to um, internet. Now, I will say the district has worked really hard um, and leveraged, again, some outside relationships to help ramp up device distribution by distributing laptops, tablets that we had um, from CPS already, and then in addition, purchasing um, additional devices so that we're almost at 100,000 devices that will have been given out now. Um, we still have a few more that we're trying to onboard and get out to students as soon as possible. If, even though you have a device, if you don't have internet access, that's another barrier and challenge. Um, and so in addressing that, there's a sort of two-part challenge to it. One part of it really is a supply issue uh, around hotspots. So we wanted initially to be able to distribute hotspots, but even if we had the resources as a district to provide all of the hotspots necessary for all of our families to have access, there actually was not a supply available internationally, as you might imagine right now all districts in the world are trying to get a hold of these and there have been some supply chain issues because some of the hardest hit um, regions initially by COVID uh, were some of the same places that produced those hotspots. Once we were able to get uh, our hands on some hotspots, the priority in distributing those hotspots has been to start with our families and students most in need. And so with philanthropic support, I will uh, add, CPS was able to provide both devices and hotspots, Wi-Fi hotspots, for our students in temporary living situations, our houseless students and their families first, in trying to, again, think strategically about how to try to meet the needs of our most vulnerable students and families first. But that still leaves many families who haven't been served. And so I think this is one of the big challenges and a really a place of major need um, for the philanthropic community, the corporate community, and our public um, government infrastructure to come together to try to solve this problem, this ongoing problem of gaining access uh, to internet. And so in the meantime, we have not stopped. Um, there are uh, hard copy packets of resources that are aligned to grade level standards that are available for students who do not have access, but certainly the goal is for us to try to get as many students as possible access to um, remote learning that can be a bit more interactive with their teachers who, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, this is Teacher Appreciation Week, teachers have been working so hard um, to get in touch with their students, to get instruction to their students, to be able to meet the needs of those students. Um, but the need is so great. And I think that's kind of where we are right now. The need is greater than what we have uh, to address that need. And so that's why the district is reaching out to all these other um, partners to try to help with this effort. And I know that I'm gonna be asking you as a historian to talk a little bit about the future. Um, mm -hmm. But can you share just sort of what we're working against? Like, what are we working to prevent? Um, and what really are we trying to think about looking forward that our students will need to make sure that they have future successes? Yeah. I mean, I think um, there's a lot of conversation in the education community right now about learning loss. But again, I want to take a step back like I did in the beginning and talk about the very base level needs, the basic level needs that our school system has historically provided for and is trying to continue to provide for and do so even more to go above and beyond. And I think that starts with basic needs like food, right? So continuing to make sure that we have the resources to keep our families fed. You can't learn if you're hungry. Um, to try as best as possible to get resources that for those who are able to give those resources and direct them to our most impacted families. Um, but I think on the, the back side of this, there's gonna be a lot of different types of concerns, um, similar to the concerns that we had before, similar to the issues and inequities that we faced before, but in fact, further exacerbated, right? So um, the social emotional needs of our young people is gonna be one of the first and top priorities and things to be addressed when we get back whatever getting back looks like. Um, mental health concerns for our students and their families. Um, the financial conditions of families, right? We have families who already were, even if they were working, the wages they were making were not enough to um, take care of all of their family's needs. And now those folks may be unemployed and may not get work back after this. So I think thinking about the financial conditions of our families um, is gonna be something really important. 
But then also, I think there are sort of like target populations that we also have specific short-term concerns about. Um, for example, post-secondary plans. So we have students who are um, graduating seniors this year who plan to attend college and now are rethinking those plans for financial reasons because they may not have enough money now to put a down payment on tuition uh, and to secure their space with enrollment. They may um, not be certain that they be, be able to afford other parts of the college experience because of what this crisis has meant. So I think there's a, a realm of post-secondary concerns that are also um, very immediate uh, and short term. And I think particularly because a lot of students, um, I think in a sort of esoteric way, I talk about it as I think one of the things I don't want this to be is a dream crushing moment for our young people. Our young people have great and exciting dreams. And I want them to still be able to have those dreams and to be able to act on those dreams, even though they're experiencing and we're all experiencing a time of really um, unprecedented uh, crisis. And I guess one thing just to say also about that crisis and what makes this moment different from other moments of crisis and in the education space in particular. Um, there have been other school systems because of natural disasters and man-made disasters that have had to shut down for periods of time. I could think of an example like Katrina in New Orleans which was a terribly traumatic experience for the young people who experienced that. On top of that, however, um, you know, even though they had to leave perhaps, when they settled in Houston or when they settled in a new space, there was a somewhat functioning uh, school system that existed in those places. Nowhere in the country right now is there a highly functioning in-person school system. So I think the, the scope of this problem is national and international. There's not sort of a, um, next place to go. And so we're all learning as we go along this journey. But I think I just keep thinking about um, wanting to try to meet the ever increasing needs of our families and being clear that those needs are going to increase, not decrease. And I also say this as someone who's teaching right now. So I'm a professor at UIC. I switched to teaching remotely. I have two little kids. I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and working while teaching, while helping them do their work or not for the three-year-old because there's not an online learning program for her um, is a bur it, it, it's, it's a lot and it's a lot for me and I am relatively comfortable, right? And so I think I, I return back to thinking about the experiences of our students, the experiences of our teachers, how dramatically they've been transformed um, and how our response to the, this crisis is going to need to be in proportion to the nature of the devastation that it's causing. Thank you for that. Um, before I open it up to everyone's questions, um, Francie and Johanna, it would be wonderful to hear about the work that the fund is doing. Um, certainly a bright spot um, in this very challenging time. And so it would be great to hear about where you're at and what's needed to continue your work over the long term, because we know that the immediate funding is important, um, but we're gonna be facing some long-term impacts that are gonna need support from our communities. Thanks for that. Yeah, I can start by just talking about the, com the Compassion Fund a little bit is what we've been focused on right now, which touches on a lot of what Elizabeth was just sharing about, you know, some of the needs of our students right now for all of the students and families that rely on CPS for more than an education. We're looking at ways we can support them through, you know, meal distribution, technology. Um, right now, we're really focused on um, the connectivity element on helping get um, Wi-Fi, MiFi devices to families so they can be have connectivity, books, books in the hands of our families, good multicultural, culturally relevant texts to families that are, you know, delivered through our meal distribution sites and just all of the ways we can, you know, have hands-on support for those, those communities while also keeping in mind, you know, all of the things that we've been looking to, you know, fundraise for and we know philanthropy can have a great impact on for, for education for our families moving forward. Yeah, so I think just repeating short-term needs are, are those immediate basic needs, basic human needs that we are trying to solve for. And I think the district's done a really great job being able to mobilize quickly um, with philanthropy's help, with some, you know, uh, the support of a, a board of education that was willing to reconsider some financial implications and, and make some necessary spending uh, occur. But that, I think, kind of leads us to our long-term point here. Um, and how philanthropy can help, none of us really know how 
long this is going to go, how this might affect summer plans. We're, we are increasingly extremely concerned about summer melt. Um, students who are in transition points between eighth grade and ninth or heading into kindergarten or a pre-K program or the transition between. Those are always vulnerable populations and always vulnerable times. And usually there is a system in place with our robust nonprofit partners in Chicago to be able to take a very hands-on approach to getting all of our students across those, those um, junctures. Uh, we're, we're still relying on those nonprofit partners very heavily right now. And so one of the things that the district has been asking for is for continued and increased investment in um, other organizations that also have access and relationships with students and families so we can um, do our best to mitigate any uh, summer melt issues or, or challenges with transitions. I think the other thing that we're we were already very mindful of, many people may know Dr. Jackson released the five-year vision for CPS uh, about a year ago now. And um, one of the uh, pillars of her uh, vision for CPS was opening an equity office that would monitor data and would um, implement uh, protocols at CPS whereby decision makers have to really reflect on uh, resource allocation and, and our policy implications for demographics and, and students who have historically been marginalized by the system. And one of the um, ways that we expect COVID is perhaps, uh, perhaps going to present an opportunity uh, for, for kids uh, heading into the fall is perhaps um, their access to city colleges and institutions that we at CPS are working really hard to strengthen the bond between so that more students are more affordably accessing post-secondary uh, options and credentials, um, perhaps are taking that two plus two approach that they hadn't been planning for, but ultimately may be more financially um, rewarding for their families. So we're, we're thinking about things like that. How can we pivot right now? How can we leverage what access to resources we do have and, and local institutions that we know our students fare well in uh, generally? Um, and then I think to the point of, of learning loss and engagement, um, we're, we're also interested in how philanthropy can help us innovate here. Um, I don't think any of us would have wished this opportunity on our city or on the world, but it has presented an increased amount of comfort with Zoom calls and um, expressing content in a digital platform. Um, there are ways that that might increase students' access to experiences that they can't maybe experience in the classroom, or there are ways that that might be able to scale um, to bigger audiences, incredible opportunities for learning. And so um, one of the, the ways that we're grateful for our philanthropy always playing a role in Chicago is kind of charting that path for innovation and learning. And um, we're hopeful that over time, we'll be able to collaborate with you to um, explore, explore those things that maybe we want to make stick in our, in our learning ecosystem going forward. Um, that said, the, in terms of immediate needs that aren't just uh, physical human needs, one of the things that we are continuing to fundraise for are just morale building efforts. Mm -hmm. The principals, as you can imagine, are incredibly um, overwhelmed. They're, they have a lot of families in mind that they think of every day that maybe they're not seeing come through the meal site or that they know um, are in need and, and haven't been able to access. The principals are also trying to support the morale of frontline workers who are showing up every day, even though they have their own students at home. Um, and so I think this is one of those moments in time where yes, like innovation and that high impact philanthropy can make a huge difference. This is also one of those times where $10 and small gift donations and basic charity also makes a very big impact. Thank you for sharing those action points for us. We have a few questions starting to roll into the chat, so I'm going to move to those. So a few comments in there and also a question from Sabrina wanting to know what the biggest role that a nonprofit organization can play in CPS in the upcoming school year. Will it mostly be around mental health and social emotional learning? Go ahead, Francie, you can go first. Okay. Go. Yeah. We're, 
we are asking for a few things. I, I mentioned the post-secondary work. Yes, social emotional learning is a big part of the district's agenda and we're looking for increased and expanded supports there. Um, right now, our, our uh, request and our hope and uh, collaboration with the nonprofits is really um, just kind of extending the reach of CPS. Um, one of the reasons the meal distribution has been such a victory for us, or, or we see it as so, is that it increases that bond and trust and um, relationship that a family has with their school. They don't only see it as the place where their kids get educated. They're starting, you know, because of meals and a, a gift card program, actually, that the Children First Fund's been able to execute um, in getting families access to cash relief quickly. The families are starting to come forward more and, and, and have uh, increased trust with the school that maybe wasn't there for them. But the nonprofits have that too. And the faith-based institutions and all of the other organizations, um, we, we would like to work together on just making sure that um, we have you know, covered their needs, but that people will be on track to show back up to school when it's time to reopen and that we're going to be able to move expeditiously to make up for lost time. Yeah, I think Francie pretty much <laughs> covered it. I, I would say certainly um, mental health and social emotional um, learning are going to be big things, right? Like we know this is traumatic. Children in our communities already experience trauma and there is additional trauma um, that is being caused by this pandemic, uh, just living through a pandemic in addition to all of the socioeconomic um, and health struggles that this may present for families and students. Um, but I do think to her point that it's also, I think, a really powerful opportunity for us as a district to open up to our community organizations, to nonprofits, um, to extend, as she said, the reach of, of who we can reach, how we can touch, and how we can find out the needs of um, students and families and support those needs. So whatever your nonprofit does, there is a place for you at CPS. I wanna open it up to see if there are other questions. Happy to have people come off mute if they prefer to ask their questions live rather than share it in the chat. Hi, uh, Basha here. Uh, I am the assistant director for assistant director of development from SkyArt, and um, I have a question in regards to partners of CPS. So we usually partner with Southside schools, um, CPS, and private. However, with the remote system, we aren't necessarily able to work with our students that are in the schools. We have been able to move our programming to a virtual platform for weekly sessions. However, we're wondering with the schools potentially still being remotely um, in the fall, how will CPS work with outside partners to get those partners, whether to work them into the schedule for CPS students or arrange for us to have access to those parents? So I would start by saying there are so many different contingency plans on the table right now, um, both for this summer and for the fall. And I don't wanna get ahead of myself in sort of prescribing um, what that that engagement is going to look like or even what a schedule will be if we are still either partially or fully in some way doing remote learning um, in the fall but what i would say is that i think it's important to continue to have the i'm not sure i don't want, we don't have to go back and forth right now but have a sense of what the sorry there's a child situation happening bye ladies thank you um please close the door thank you um <laughs> Sorry, if there's a, um, oh, which unit, what departments you were previously um, engaging with, and I don't know if it was arts, if you were working directly through the art department or through some of our other outreach or face or other departments, but to making sure to continue those connections. And then I'm happy also to give my contact information directly. If you have questions and concerns as you move through and get, as we get closer to the fall and have clear plans on what that's going to look like. And I know that's not satisfying because everyone wants to be able to plan but i think that's one of the things that 
I for myself, both personally and professionally, have been trying to work on in this moment is figuring out what we can and what we can't plan for. And I just think right now, there's so much uncertainty about what the summer looks like that it's even hard to predict what, what the fall is going to be. Sure. Well, that would be great. I would love your contact. Um, yeah, I can type it. Let me figure out. I'm sorry, I'm on an iPad. I'm not normally on. Thank you for that question, Anyone else? My name is Tal I, Hazak Lowy. I'm with Friends of the Children Chicago. Um, I'm really heartened to hear your um, willingness to partner with, with organizations that are working with disconnected families. Um, we have, it's a challenge we've had with CPS over this last year. Um, and uh, I hope we can keep talking about that issue because there's so many deep layers that our families are facing, right? So beyond just money, food, access to technology, it's how to turn the technology on, how to access the accounts, um, reminding them and encouraging them to actually do that, right? Like we all know the challenges we have keeping our kids on track um, when we have sort of highly functioning regular days, but to your point is that you open this, um, our families, these, the families we're talking about were in crisis prior to this. And so we need sort of, they need beyond wraparound services, but really sort of an embrace of support. And mm -hmm. so I really look forward to us being able to uh, continue this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I do think that it's, um, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm not one who actually likes to think about crises as moments of opportunity, but I, I do think that we have an opportunity to be very intentional right now about how we're reaching out, how we're embracing each other as disparate organizations and interests across the city to move forward um, in an equitable way that's really addressing um, our families' needs. So thank you for your willingness to partner. I know there has been wariness and, and well warranted, so thank you. Thank you for that question, Tal. We have a few other questions coming in through the chat. One from Deborah Harrington. Um, with a long history of inequity and knowing this is grounded in structural and systematic barriers, are there specific public policies um, that can be impactful on the field of education in this moment? Mm, yes. <laughs> so um, thank you first, Deborah, for the question. And I also just want to give Deborah a shout out um, for embracing me prior to me being even in this position and, and bringing me into the fold and introducing me to everyone um, in Chicago, African Americans and philanthropy as well. So thank you, Deborah. Um, but I do think there's a number of things uh, that are really important right now on a policy level. And it starts at the top with the federal government. Um, and I think at the federal level, there is such a need for in whatever this next round of um, stimulus funding is going to look like to really double down on the whole on a holistic idea of what it looks like to support education right now. So that support for education means support for housing. So that support for education means, um, you know, not a standard level of funding, but going above and beyond that. And I think there's a real need in terms of a sort of um, political pressure to continue to fund education at a high level and to increase that funding. Because I think often education is one of the first places um, where cuts are made in times of austerity, right? Or in times of budget cuts. And this is a time where we should be increasing investment in our young people, increasing investment in our most impacted communities. And I think there is a really strong need to advocate for such policies, um, at, again, at the federal, state, and local level. But the largest pools of money tend to be coming from the federal government right now. I don't know, Francie, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I, I, I guess I can just speak to a couple of things that the district has tried to do over the last couple of years to battle some of this um, structural inequity. Um, a few things and happy to share some resources or speak more deeply about them at another time. But I mentioned the equity office as one way. Another way has been um, small schools supplements in the budget process. Um, currently at least with population decline um, largely occurring in African-American communities. We end up with schools who are um, through the student-based budgeting formula who are impacted negatively and not able to add some of the enriching experiences without a supplement or additional funds coming from the district to be able to shore up their educational programs. So that's one of the things that um, Dr. Jackson and the team have implemented 
Um, new student program RFPs have been another big focus. So uh, actually, instead of just deciding where an IB or a STEM program will go, allowing us to hear from community and have community and school communities apply to the district to request specific programs be added to the schools. Um, I think another uh, a few things that the board has been doing and opening up the board meetings and um, having them based in the community so that we're able to get more diverse parent voices engaging in the process has been another thing. So, um, you know, again, happy to, you know, highlight these things further. Um, uh, oh, and the, the other one I wanted to mention was the relationship with city colleges. So if you haven't already heard about it, you'll be hearing soon about a new partnership between CPS and city colleges called the Chicago Roadmap. And the idea is to essentially break down institutional silos between the two institutions such that our students are far more seamlessly able to walk from one institution to the next, identify uh, career paths that have economic value, uh, credentials of economic value so that they can um, you know, access economic mobility more easily. And these are, um, you know, uh, kind of career and technical education programs and, and opportunities that we have not um, in recent years done a lot of expansion of or um, assessment of where they are in, in proximity to what communities are requesting. And so um, there, there are several efforts to try to rectify where we are seeing grave inequities that uh, you know have the results that that we don't wish to see, um, but certainly happy also to hear recommendations and and be um, advised of things that the district could be keeping more top of mind, especially yeah. as it pertains to COVID. Sorry, one one thing just to add to that. So we're just getting off of right like right before, I guess, this everything shut down. Um, we had done a series of budget. Um, budget meetings in the community. Um, there were six total, I think, in a period of a couple weeks where we went out into uh, where CPS and the mayor's office um, put together these um, listening sessions in the community to hear folks' thoughts about the budgets. And we had great turnout for these events and a report was put out that came out from that. And some of the recommendations, uh, just to again, give a sense of like, going back to normal is not okay because normal was not enough. Normal was not meeting the needs of our students and families. Um, and one of the big things in that, those budget um, sessions that people were, were sort of a revelation to them sometimes is that our current level of state funding um, for Chicago public schools is only at 60 some odd percent of what the state deems as adequate funding. So we were already well below that threshold. And the state did change to something called evidence-based funding um, for public schools a couple of years ago, and that has brought more funds into the district, but not enough to close that gap between 60 some odd percent um, and 100 percent of what it would look like to be adequately funded. And to fill that gap prior to all of this would have required $2 billion, with a B, more dollars um, to meet the, what the state defined as an adequately funded public school system. So I think to that end, some of the recommendations that came out of that working group um, that was doing those community engagement sessions included things like advocating at all levels, I mentioned federal level, but also the state level for a graduated income tax um, for other modes of fully funding the evidence-based funding formula. There was a timeline when that bill passed um, about what fully funding that formula would look like and we're already behind where that was supposed to be. So I think again, it's a moment to reinforce that going back to normal was not okay and we need to push even further. Thank you both for that. It's really helpful to have an understanding of the improvements that need to be made system-wide. And I wanna ask you to dig a little deeper on that with Karenina's questions about addressing inequities in the system. And so her question, um, is to understand the implications for how we create equitable access to quality education moving forward. We know that equity issues are not new, but more visible to a larger segment of the population. And how do we move forward on system changes? Yeah, so as Francie mentioned, um, CPS did establish an equity office. They actually have a draft of their um, 
equity framework that's up on the CPS website if you want to take a look at that and they I should also add they are still um, accepting feedback on that so if you have feedback on the equity framework I really encourage you to give it um, but I think the idea of what equity means in this context and generally is something that's really important and I think one of the foundational um, tenets of the uh, framework is about addressing those mo students with the greatest need first. And I think that in this moment, uh, one of the things that I've been happy to see is the way that that has been done, for example, with um, addressing uh, the remote learning needs of students living in temporary living situations first as the first sort of round as funds and as um, opportunity to address those needs became available. But to the point, it is a larger structural issue. And I think that it requires a number of things. Um, in addition to a reordering of funding priorities, which we discussed already, it also requires a continued and increased collaboration and conversations with our communities, making sure that programs, um, Francie mentioned the new programs that were uh, being put in place are directed um, towards those most in need. And just as sort of a, a specific example of how that got implemented based on the feedback from going out into the community in this year's budget is one of the things, and I, I was actually at all six of the um, budget meetings in the community, and one of the things that we heard everywhere is that there needed to be a robust consideration of what need looked like that went beyond free and reduced lunch status in a community. And so now one of the ways that funds and new programs, one of the considerations in that is um, based on the har a hardship index, which takes into account a far greater range um, of factors in a community, median income, um, unemployment rates, um, instability in housing across a community area in trying to assess the needs of that community. Um, so that's sort of a top-down way of thinking about different ways to assess those needs and thinking about addressing the needs of those who have been historically disfranchised um, explicitly. I think that is one set of, of uh, sort of uh, ways to think about this question, but I do think there is an openness and a need also to hear from communities. So it's not just top-down decisions and ideas about what equity looks like, but also hearing from our communities about what their needs and greatest concerns are. And there are, of course, mechanisms for this that already exist, first and foremost, at the school level, local school councils, um, which local school councils are elected officials um, in our city. They are the most diverse and racially and socioeconomically representative group of elected officials in our city. Um, and so to listen to LSEs, to engage with LSEs, also our community action councils, which are in-house. But I think also listening to our community partners, um, one of the things that's been interesting about and that I've enjoyed about being a board member is that we hold office hours and community groups, individuals, any of you can come through and sign up for our office hours. And it's a way for us to get that direct input. Um, but I think working with our um, family and community engagement team that are already doing this work on the ground to continue to show up in spaces where folks are already organizing around this work to learn and to listen and to be open to thinking about um, how that input is also crucial to the future direction um, of the school system. But I appreciate your point that this is, this is longstanding. It's not going to change overnight, but if we are not intentional, it will not change. Francie, I see a lot of head nodding, so just want to hold space in case there are things you want to add to that comment as well. Okay, I'll get there. We got it. Another question in the chat. Um, what additional support beyond financial can corporations and vendor partners of CPS provide? Francie, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah. Um, we've seen a lot of really tremendous activations happen over the course of uh, this experience. Um, one that we're particularly excited about, maybe you'll see on social soon, is um, President Obama made some surprise phone calls to teachers yesterday and um, gave a, a shout out to them for their hard work during this time. And so certainly, um, you know, civic leaders um, and even, you know, employees activating around showing appreciation for teachers and frontline workers, those things really do matter right now. Uh, perhaps more than ever. Um, you know, Elizabeth was, was sharing how challenging it is, and you all are probably experiencing this too, but we just asked uh, a labor force of people to do something that they've never done before. 
Um, and our educators love students. They love the classroom. That's why they do what they do. And um, they they have really shown a lot of, um, um, you know, tenacity during this time and, and, and been incredible. And so I think um, working with the Children First Fund team, we'd be really happy to uh, talk to any companies and vendors who wanted to get involved in other ways. Another thing that we've been doing a lot of is uh, facilitating in-kind donations that make sense for the schools. Um, technology was, was one of the bigger areas where we've done that. We've seen a little bit of um, PPE come in that we've been able to distribute and disseminate to the schools. So it's a couple examples of in-kind things um, that aren't just uh, morale building efforts, but um, I, I think I'll, I'll just underscore again, this is a situation where dollars are making a tremendous difference and we are positioned to take even small dollar donations. I think if you look at our website today, um, with thanks to some promotion from one of our partners, we have seen maybe 50 or so, you know, donations under $100 come in. And those donations are going straight back out into communities in the form of cash relief, um, network chiefs and principals who know best, who's showing up for meal distribution every day, who, you know, just experienced a loss in their family or had a, some other traumatic event happen, is most in need of um, extra support or cash assistance. So um, we would encourage our corporate partners and vendors to, to consider continuing to give financially. But there are a lot of different ways that we would be eager to partner um, and, and uh, elevate optimism and, and support for our staff right now. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, I think one of the things that is unique about the position of the Children's First Fund in this moment is that it is the philanthropy arm of Chicago Public Schools. So if you want to direct, you can tailor your giving um, in whatever way you want. And I've seen people talk about, um, you know, I want to adopt this school and take care of the, um, you know, uh, Wi-Fi for this community, or I want to adopt this community and give a particular um, thing. This is not non-financial per se, but just as another example of something that happened just this week, um, uh, Chicago Public Schools, with the help of the Children's First Fund um, and funds from the Children's First Fund, is now going to have CPS TV, which is where several of our local television stations are now going to be um, airing programming, some of which was produced by Chicago Public Schools, others is just sort of approved for young, uh, young people um, at particular hours of the day. And I know it's ABC7, Univision, um, WTTW, I feel like I'm missing some, another, a couple other channels. Um, yeah, who have uh, partnered for this, just as sort of another example of the way that, <clears throat> excuse me, folks are really um, wrapping their arms around uh, our communities right now and our young people and their families. Um, but I, again, I do think that the, um, the, the role of the Children's First Fund is a way to get dollars right to those most at need. And, and we see that because that's who we serve, right? Our, our student population is uh, an over, a super majority of students of color a super majority of low income students, a significant portion of houseless students and families. And so trying to get um, a sort of greatest impact from those dollars, the Children's First Fund is actually really uniquely positioned to do that and get that money in and right back out to where it's needed right away. So I'm gonna use my facilitator's prerogative to ask the last question as we bring this call to close. But we've got folks who work at foundations, um, folks who work in the nonprofit and social sector, just as well as folks who are just personally concerned about this issue on the call. And I'm wondering if you can each share an action or a way as an individual that people can get involved in supporting this effort in this moment. Francie, I'll let you start. Um, well, I just encouraged you to visit our website at the Children's First Fund. That's a simple way. And following us on social, um, that's a shameless plug. But truthfully, uh, this has been a major investment for Dr. Jackson and CPS to relaunch the organization and try to make it more um, helpful to CPS. Most urban school districts have a philanthropic arm like a Children's First Fund. And 
for, you know, for many reasons that just wasn't the case in Chicago for a long time. Um, the Children First Fund is able to mobilize resources and able to be directly just responsive to CPS right now. Um, and so we're excited by that and, and anything that you can do to share our content or follow what we're having or spread the word about the new role that we're playing in the city would be tremendously helpful to us. Um, you know, every, every opportunity that we get grows our, our community of people and allows us to help more students. So we would be grateful for that. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Joanna to maybe ask for something less selfish than I. <laughs> well, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening today. And I feel like if there's anything that resonated with you to share that with your network, to share the work that CPS and the Children First Fund is doing and how, you know, Francie shared the link, but we would just love to keep spreading the word to the community and the network to make sure that people know how they can get involved and how they can support CPS students and families right now. Yeah, I mean, I think they've covered it. <laughs> but I guess I guess what I would just say is, I, I, I'll just speak for myself and how I've been um, sort of thinking about this as a, both individual, but also a board member and thinking about what my role can be to try to um, increase awareness about this. So sometimes that's been me sending out emails to folks um, explicitly, you know, asking for donations to the fund uh, of like wealthy individuals or foundations to let them know about what's going on. But also just to the point um, that was made before of raising awareness. I think sometimes, uh, I don't think everyone's clear on the needs that exist right now. Um, and the needs, honestly, that are the, the needs that our schools are meeting and I think that's really an important point is that as I sort of start out and how I started right now, public schools are on the front lines of what of the crises that are happening all around them, because all of the families that are being most impacted by this go to our schools, or I should say not all but many, a great number of them, or a part of families with young people who come to our schools and rely on us for more than just education. And so I think just kind of socializing, honestly, that message of the importance of public education right now, um, of the importance of supporting our young people and their families, whether that's through advocacy for policy change and funding at the local, state, or national level, whether they're able to contribute to the Children's First Fund or just raise, raise awareness about what they're doing, um, reaching out to a teacher and telling them that they love them, <laughs> uh, checking on your young people, um, who you do know, and really just checking in on folks. I mean, I've been doing a lot of checking in, and I think sometimes that checking in leads to how can I help? How can I support? I don't have much to give, but I want to give to something that's going to be impactful. Uh, and I've been sending them to Francie and Joanna. Well, I want to give a huge thanks to the three of you for joining us for this call. It was highly informative, and I think it's given us a lot to walk away with and think about how we can get involved in this work. So really appreciate both the work you're doing and the opportunity to join us. And thank you to everyone who joined the call for your active participation and for learning about this topic. Um, I hope that you will follow up with Elizabeth. She's added her contact information in the chat, as well as the Children's First Fund. The website is there, so I really do hope everyone will get engaged in thinking about this issue. Thank you so much on behalf of the leadership team of CAPE for joining this call, and I hope to see you all again as we continue to host these calls throughout the month. Thanks, everybody. And thank you all. I just want to say thanks to everyone again for showing up today, and thank you for the work that you all are doing in your organizations, right? Like, it takes all of us to mm -hmm. try to um, you know, meet that scale of the needs that exist right now, and also drawing on that community wisdom, and you all are tapped in and part of that community wisdom. So thank you for showing up today. Um, I hope we can continue to stay in conversation um, and that you all are take good care of yourselves and your families. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.